Hey everybody, my name is Chelo Siki, and I'm going to be going through pest prevention with proper pruning and maintenance with you. And this is going to be intended for looking at trees, shrubs, perennials, and shrub sub shrubs. So how to care for plants in your landscape in a way that helps prevent pests. And this video is specifically for trees, shrubs, perennials, and subshrubs. So uh, let's dive into it. Prevent pests with proper pruning and maintenance. So a lot of times the pruning and maintenance um, practices that we utilize in our landscapes to make our gardens and our plants look amazing can end up causing some pest issues. So through the proper pruning and care of different plant types, a plant's ability to fight pest pressure is significantly increased. Okay? So if we properly care and prune for the prune these plants, then those plants end up being more healthy, healthy and much more resilient to um, pest pressure. Understanding how and when to prune and care for the different plants in your garden will help to preserve air and water quality and protect wildlife by reducing the need for chemical pesticides and fertilizers. Okay, so a lot of times we end up in, the, in this really rough cycle of pruning our plants, but not really understanding what type of plant it is and when we should prune it. And unintentionally, we injure the plant or put that plant into decline. And when we do that, we end up with a situation that that plant is much more prone to pest pressure. All of a sudden, that plant has aphids or some other um, pest that we don't wanna see in our gardens, uh, powdery mildew, um, sooty mold, ants, et cetera. And what do we do? We end up reaching for chemicals to solve the problem. Well. Ultimately, the result of that is that we're using chemical pesticides and in order to make our plants look better, we fertilize them. But a lot of times we're using products that are harmful for the environment, especially the pesticides and the fertilizers, which feed those plants to try to get them healthy. But when those fertilizers run off into our waterways, we end up with really heavy challenges with our water quality in our local rivers. So the intent of this presentation is to go through with you how to recognize what kind of plants you've got, how to address that plant by properly pruning and caring for it. And again, specifically, we're gonna be looking at trees and woody shrubs, things like crepe myrtles, butterfly bushes, carpet roses, and some California natives. Also, we will be looking at perennials, like um, examples of perennials would be California fuchsia or Santa Barbara daisy or um, yarrow. Um, uh, also, sub shrubs. So, sort of sub shrubs are sort of in between a woody shrub and a perennial. Perennials are typically kind of herbaceous, and sub shrubs um, have a portion, generally the base portion of the plant that is woody, and then the exterior mass of the plant is much more herbaceous in nature. And so we need to treat those plants just a little bit different. Okay, so we're gonna be going through trees, woody shrubs, perennials, and subshrubs. <clears throat> so it's important to understand the type of care that is needed. And this type of care is broadly based on the type of plant that you're actually caring for. 
trees and woody shrubs, perennials, subshrubs, ornamental grasses, et cetera. Um, they all have different growth habits. And so understanding what those growth habits are and when those different growths happen throughout the seasons helps us to understand how we need to care for it. Now, the amount of care that will be needed in order to properly care for the plants in your landscape really depends on the plants in your garden and your preferences for how tidy they look. Okay, If you need a clean, um, tightly uh, pruned appearance, well, there's going to be some inherent pest problems that come along with that. If you're okay with the more natural look um, and uh, the associated pruning and care, which plants prefer, um, then you're going to have a much easier time um, uh, pruning and caring to prevent pests and a lot less associated maintenance required. The other thing that's going to really um, drive how much care will be needed. And what that translates to is how much time is going to need to be spent in this landscape to properly care for it really boils down to plant spacing. If you have a lot of plants packed into a very small space, a lot of times that just requires much more care. Okay, So um, understanding that is a very important piece of making sure that we can care for our plants, we have the time to care for our plants, and we're doing it in a way that reduces the need for pesticides and fertilizers. So again, we're looking at trees, woody shrubs, perennials, and subshrubs. The first section that we're gonna look at are trees and woody shrubs. When we're talking about this, we're talking about generally the much larger plants in your landscape. Things like red buds and Indian hawthorns, rosemary, bottle brush, loripetalum, manzanitas, pittosporum, crepe myrtles, um, uh, butterfly bushes, roses, ceanothus, grevillea, junipers, berberis or barberries, right? So um, these are, this is the category of plant that we're looking at, okay? So these are just a few of plants that exemplify um, uh, or fall into the category of trees and woody shrubs. Um, uh, again, there's many, many more, but these are really typical plants that we, we find in landscapes in Sacramento County. So, um, now we're gonna dive into caring for those trees and woody shrubs. Generally, once those plants are established and mature, you don't need to fertilize them, okay? Although some roses benefit from fertilization and especially the hybrid tea roses where we're really growing those for their cut flowers, um, that may, it could be probably one of the only section or, or plants that really may require some additional fertilizer. But in general, the trees and woody shrubs that we find in the greater Sacramento um, uh, region, um, uh, they don't require any fertilizer once they're mature. What you can do instead is add compost. Okay, so a good compost application at the base of that plant, water it in really well, knead it into the soil lightly, um, uh, can really benefit those plants. Um, mulching and avoiding compaction. So just getting a good three to four inch layer of mulch down on the soil, making sure that it's covered. This helps us to um, uh, reduce opportunity for compaction because there's a soft layer that if somebody's walking through it or running equipment through it, um, through that area, it has a tendency to compact less. Um, uh, when we are uh, making these applications of compost and mulch, um, 
it's important to understand that if you've got established plants with established root crowns, so the root crown was the area on the plant that goes from soil root up to above ground plant parts, at that point right there, you never want to change the um, the height of the soil or whatever's around it. So if you're going to add compost and mulch, make sure that you don't add it right up and onto the base of that plant. Keep it a good 12 inches away and taper it down in depth so that you don't negatively impact that established plant. <clears throat> now, as long as the plant has been selected and placed into an area that is uh, acceptable for its mature size, you shouldn't really have to prune it, okay? But there are some exceptions to this. So looking at trimming and pruning, um, this can't really be stressed enough. Planting plants too close together is really the biggest problem in the majority of landscapes. It's really, we, we don't do it intentionally. We're not trying, when, when it happens, nobody's trying to cause an issue. It's really just a natural tendency to overplant, um, especially when you're starting with plants that are very small. Maybe you buy a bunch of plants uh, at the nursery and they're one gallon size plants and then you put them in, you don't quite really comprehend that that particular plant is gonna grow to be six feet tall by six feet wide. And eventually, once those mature, we end up with a large woody shrub really closely planted to another large woody shrub or some other type of plant. And when they're really close together, there's not much you can do but um, uh, prune them so that they aren't taking each other over. So it's very important um, to not overplant, to recognize that plants grow to some certain mature size. And if you're buying plants at a nursery, um, the nurseryman uh, can definitely tell you what mature size that plant grows to. Now, um, uh, if we're talking about caring for plants, it's much easier to care for plants when they're spaced appropriately given their mature size. So most pruning can be avoided entirely by having the right size plants for the available space within that area. Okay, so um, again, unintentional generally, but we can really get ourselves into some really high maintenance situations that significantly encourage pest infestations if we have to heavily prune these plants because they're planted way too close together. So, really, um, when we're planning our gardens, just keep in mind, these plants grow. They will grow. They, um, they will grow into their mature size as long as the conditions at that site are more or less acceptable to that plant. So this is an example of a newly planted landscape. You can see that the majority of these probably went in as one gallon or five gallon plants. And they are spaced more or less appropriately. In looking at this, it's hard to recognize exactly what every single one is, but we can. I can see that there are, um, uh, this is probably a grevillea that gets up to about four to six feet tall and wide, and it's planted adjacent to some other plants that get um, just a little bit smaller than that. So inevitably in this landscape, this is probably going to grow in to be a problem when it comes to trimming and pruning and pest prevention. Ultimately, the best solution, if you had a situation like this and those plants grew into maturity, the best solution is probably to remove some of the plants, okay? 
Sometimes plants are put in as temporary fillers, maybe not the best move, but it makes the landscape look a little bit more full before all the plants come into maturity. But once they come into maturity and you end up with a situation where things are really packed up against each other, really consider removing some of those plants in order to create space for the other plants to come into their mature size, which will reduce the use of pesticides, reduce the need for fertilizers, and reduce the amount of time it takes to care for this landscape. So this next example shows a newly planted landscape with pretty appropriately spaced plants. That landscape a couple years later, okay, or a similar landscape at semi-maturity. So a couple seasons in, the plants are growing in just fine. And then finally, we get to a planting um, scheme that's definitely mature. Now, in this example, the majority of these plants are spaced quite appropriately. Okay, so um, first season, second or third season, and this would be fourth and on season. These plants have grown into maturity. They aren't heavily growing into each other. You can see that you've got a single rock rose here, and it's for the most part at mature size. We've got another one. You can see that it sort of curves around that circular pattern that they're just barely growing into each other. So there's no significant need to really shear the heck out of them to control their size, which when we do that, we're creating pest issues. Now, here, this is quite the traditional or more conventional landscape where plants are sheared and molded into various shapes. Okay, so in looking at this, we see some boxwood down here. This looks like some privet. Um, and then this may be something else, an escalonia, I'm not sure. But when we look at this, right, overall, from a visual standpoint, this could be very pleasing to um, uh, some people's aesthetic. However, when you shear plants in this manner, you inevitably create conditions that encourage pest infestations. So when we're shearing these plants, what we're doing is we're indiscriminately cutting leaves, stems, etc., in not necessarily the proper spot. What that does is it sets up a reaction by the plant to produce more auxiliary growth, which will significantly fill in the exterior canopy of the plant, which you can see, you can't see into these plants at all. When we're pruning, so the result of that is we get a reduction in air circulation and a buildup of dead plant material within the interior of the plant, which is frankly a recipe for powdery mildew, sooty mold, weevil infestations, all sorts of different plant pest issues. The other thing that this does is if every time that the landscape maintenance company or the homeowner um, comes out to this landscape, they need to shear this, what that does is the plant's reaction is that it wants to push out heavy vegetative growth, right? Because we've injured the plant and, and we've cut a lot of its mature leaves in half or thirds. We've essentially ripped them apart. And that plant is gonna spend energy trying to get rid of those damaged leaves. And it's gonna spend a lot of energy trying to push out brand new leaves, which means heavy vegetative growth. When we get heavy vegetative growth, there's a lot of pests that strongly prefer heavy vegetative growth. Aphids, for instance, aphids in spring love 
lush vegetative growth, young leaves. And so a lot of times, again, this encourages powdery mildew, sooty mold, weevil infestations, and aphids, okay, which the aphids end up um, uh, causing ant issues. And then we feel like we need to spray some pesticides in order to correct the pest issue that inadvertently we've created ourselves. So let's sort of flip this around a little bit and look at what the plant is. Is it properly spaced? Taking out some plants if it's appropriate and pruning and trimming these plants properly and at the right time of year. So to properly prune plants or to control the size of a plant, we have to understand how plants will react to this, okay? So it's really this like cycle of creating more and more challenges. So once you start pruning, the more you'll have to prune to keep up with that plant's reaction to being pruned, which in the result of that, is it just means that it's more work for you or the landscape professional in the landscape, which means more time for you or more money to pay to the landscape professional. So plant selection and plants in the right place for the right size area is really the key. When we have to continuously prune plants, unnecessarily because they're planted in the areas that are too small for them, we end up with excessive green waste that's being created unnecessarily. That green waste ends up going to the landfill for composting, or if it ends up being in a mixed load, it ends up going into the garbage area and of, of the landfill and ends up being buried in the um, landfill and creating methane, um, which is a potent greenhouse gas. So in looking at this, this is a willow. Okay? And this is a willow in a landscape. And the owner of this landscape wanted to try to control the height and size of this. So they did a heading cut to it. When you do a heading cut, so they cut it somewhere up in here. When you do a heading cut, inevitably the plant's reaction is to push out more branches. It's lost its top branch, which has the most dominance. And so the reaction is it needs to push out more branches in order to survive. So we end up with more and more and more plants um, or, or more and more um, branches on the plants, which need to be headed back or hedged. Okay, so the more you prune, the more you'll have to prune, the more you'll have to hedge, the more green waste you'll create. And it's just a terrible cycle of trying to deal with this plant, control its size, but the result is excessive green waste and pest pressure because you're injuring the plant every single time you prune it. A lot of shrubs and trees are topped, okay? Um, we see this a lot with crepe myrtles. It is the most harmful pruning practice. It removes the leaf bearing crown of the tree or shrub. It, trigger, it triggers survival mechanisms that you can see what it's done. The, this tree was topped in a couple different spots. And the result is that it starts sending up excessive amounts of shoots in order to compensate for the fact that it has been topped. A plant or tree never regains its natural shape after that. It stresses the plant. And generally, the result is 
that the same thing with these plants back here. The result is the plant puts out excessive heavy vegetative growth and the plant ends up with aphid infestations. Okay, so by, by approaching this these plants in a way that's inappropriate, such as heading, hedging, or topping trees or shrubs to control their height or encourage heavy blooms, you end up injuring these plants to a point or to a degree that significantly increases the likelihood that those plants will have a pest infestation. It's very bad to top trees. It's not good for the tree and it causes excessive unnecessary plant pest infestations. Proper tree pruning. It's very important that we, especially with trees, trees, um, trees we're planting really for um, them to hit mature size years down the road. So recognizing that and understanding that when we plant these trees, the first couple years, it's very important that you train the young trees. So really when they're under three seasons old in the ground, making sure that we're making any kind of appropriate cuts or modifications at that point um, uh, is much more beneficial to that plant than making some sort of corrective prunings much further down the road. So making wise small pruning cuts with a handheld pruner or loppers when the plant is young avoids very traumatic for the plant chainsaw cuts later okay now there's a ton of workshops this this is a pretty um you know there's a little bit of technical expertise that comes along with this but there's tons of workshops and guides that are available through the Sacramento Tree Foundation. You can go to sactree.com for more guidance for training your trees when they're young. And it's very important. If you're unsure, hire a professional to do that training. Um, ultimately, once a tree is mature, it's significantly best to have an arborist come out to deal with that plant once it's mature. Prune when it's needed. So if you're addressing a younger plant, a younger tree, and, and this right here is generally the very first thing that you do in any pruning um, activity. Dead, diseased, and crossing branches are removed first. Dead, diseased, and crossing branches are removed first, okay? Now, this is a pretty easy one, okay? Because you need to pull any dead material out. You need to pull any disease material out. And if branches are crossing, you need to correct that. And that means that we need to take out one of those two or multiple branches that are crossing. In the event that branches are crossing, you need to step back and look at the overall structure of that plant and decide which branch or stem you should be removing. And that would be the one that is least, that contributes least to the overall structure of that plant, okay? So um, first move is remove dead, disease, and crossing branches. Next, we're gonna prune to increase air circulation. So generally that means that we are pruning to open up the interior of the canopy into a more open vase-like or rounded shape. Pruning to increase flowering, depending on the type of plant it is, pruning to increase flowering can be one um, of the, the next pruning techniques that you would use. Crepe myrtle is a good example of that. Um, crepe myrtles bloom off of the newest growth. 
So rather than top the crepe myrtles to achieve that, which is significantly detrimental to the health of that crepe myrtle and again, encourages pest pressure, instead find the tips of the um, previous year's growth and generally those will have um, old seed pods on it and prune those off. Okay, just nip those off, those tips that have the old um, uh, um, uh, seed pods on them. Um, prune those all off and you'll increase flowering. Next, prune to maintain shape. This is removing any rogue branches. Sometimes there's just an oddball branch that's just reaching way out. You need to follow that, um, you need to follow that branch down to an appropriate spot um, and that's going to be to the next fork on the branch or sometimes all the way back to the trunk of the tree in order to cor correct um, that odd shape okay and we also sometimes prune to rejuvenate some california natives okay not all but we may be pruning sort of a heavier pruning in order to rejuvenate those california natives So proper pruning techniques, thinning cuts are those that remove an entire branch back to the main stem or a similarly sized lateral or the ground in multi-trunk or multi-stemmed um, shrubs. So making thinning cuts is very important and it's, very, it's a very good way to maintain interior air circulation within those plants, which again makes, when we have good air circulation, um, it reduces the potential for these plants to get um, uh, pests like sooty mold and powdery mildew. This is best done during the winter, okay? Best done during the winter with most plants. The reason that it's done best done during the winter with most plants is because most plants are in more of a, even if they're not deciduous trees or shrubs, they um, are typically in more of a dormant state during the winter. It's colder, they're respiring slower. And so removing or thin thinning um, out this plant it's much easier for that plant to recover from the injuries that are caused by this pruning activity. When there's plenty of moisture in the air, it's respiring slowly, there's moisture in the ground, as opposed to doing some sort of thinning cuts in late July or early August when it is 105 degrees out you're causing injury, putting that plant into stress, and ultimately potentially killing the plant. There are some California natives that it's more appropriate to prune them in the summertime. Um, those are typically plants that are um, uh, blooming or in their best vegetative state during the winter time. Okay, and they go a little bit more dormant during the summertime. And that's a natural um, uh, uh, characteristic of many California native plants and some Mediterranean climate adapted plants um, that they're used to lots of water in the wintertime and dry heat in the summertime. And so they have evolved to adapt to that. And so they go into more of a dormant state in the, su in the um, summer months, as opposed to a lot of our ornamental exotic plants. And exotic just means that they're not from California. Um, uh, a lot of those plants are really in heavier vegetative states during the summertime um, and more dormant during the winter. When you're doing these thinning cuts, focus on not removing more than a quarter to a third of the plant itself, okay? so. That's a really good general rule of thumb for any type of pruning activity, including lawns. 
Um, you don't ever want to remove more than one third of the leaf blade when you're pr when you're cut mowing the lawn. And this holds true with um, shrubs and trees, etc., as well, because if you remove more than a third of that plant's ability to photosynthesize, there's a really good chance that you kill that plant or significantly diminish its health. So when you're trying to figure out how much to do, go no more than one third. If your tree or shrub needs more than a third removed, do it in stages. Maybe one winter, remove a third, let it recover, go through a summer, go back into a winter, and that next winter, remove another third. Okay, so pay attention to it, but know that if you are removing plant material off of a plant, general rule of thumb, no more than one third of that plant should be removed. Smaller cuts are always better. That's why training plants from a very young age is much better for the plant because it can recover from it. Um, make sure you're using sharp and clean tools. Every time that we make a pruning cut, we're injuring the plant. So it's very important that that cut is as clean as possible and it's made in a location on the plant that the plant can recover from it as quickly as possible using the least amount of energy in order to do so. So when removing disease branches, um, you should consider disinfecting tools between cuts, okay? So that comes into play with a lot of plants that have um, uh, back, potential bacterial infections, okay? So one example is um, pear trees, ornamental pears. They're very susceptible to blights. And you can see blights on pear trees and you have very healthy looking pear tree, but there's a couple branches usually located more towards the top that literally are just dying from the top going down. That's typically a blight. And if you prune that out, that bacteria gets onto your pruning blade. And if you go to make more cuts on that plant, you're spreading that blight. If you use that same tool and go prune some other plants, you're spreading that blight. So be very careful when you're pruning diseased branches that you're aware of what the potential disease is. And the best safest bet is to disinfect those tools between the cuts. The way that you can disinfect those tools is simply by using a 10% bleach solution. Okay, so if you take some bleach, mix it one part bleach to nine parts water, you're in pretty good shape. Also using some um, rubbing alcohol can, can do the trick as well. When you're doing it, just make sure that you're being careful not to cut yourself and that afterwards you're drying that, um, uh, that disinfectant off before you're making more cuts. Okay, so be aware that you can cause more problems um, if you aren't dis disinfecting your tools between cuts, especially with plants that have bacterial infections. Okay, so if you see some sort of abnormal growth, that dead diseased portion, be aware of it, okay? And make those disinfecting cuts or make those disinfect that um, uh, tool between cuts. Do not leave stubs, okay? So don't leave stubs. If you can see this picture here, this is a really, really good example of how to make a proper cut. Um, two things that I wanna point out. First thing is the location of the cut itself, okay? So the cut is not up against the trunk itself, it's set just off of the trunk, 
at just outside the branch collar. And I'll go through and show you guys the branch collar in subsequent slides. But just outside that branch collar, you can see that it's a lopper being used. So first thing is that the location of the cut is good and the size of the branch that's being removed is small. Okay, so two good things there. Next good thing about this pruning here is that the location of the cutting portion of the tool in relation to the crushing portion of the tool is in the proper spot. So the cutting portion of the tool is up against the portion of the plant that is going to remain. This is a blade. It will cut cleanly through this branch while this portion holds that branch in place. But as a result of the pressure of that branch getting pushed down against that holding portion, the bypass portion of this tool, that bypass portion is going to crush the plant material. It's okay doing it this way because the crushed plant material is going to go to be composted. It's not going to stay on that plant. If you had the blade flipped around and you crush the portion of the material that's going to stay on the plant, it's going to take much longer for that plant to recover. So location of the cut, the size of the branch itself and the um, look and the the blade portion, the cutting portion of the tool being against the side of the plant that's going to remain. All good technique there. Now, when these cuts are made, especially on trees and any woody shrub, that's an injury. Um, uh, that's an injury that is caused to that plant. Now, the reaction that happens is that the plant doesn't have the capability to heal the wound, okay? This will always be a wound, and you can see in this larger cut here, that portion of the plant actually dies. Now, what the plant does instead of healing the wound is it compartmentalizes the wound. And you can see right here, this is a callus roll that on the exterior is bark. And this callus roll will over years and years end up closing up this wound or compartmentalizing the wound, not healing it. That's why making cuts as early as possible, much smaller, that plant has the opportunity to much to compartmentalize that wound in a much faster way, okay? So these larger cuts, larger branches, just take way longer for that plant to compartmentalize. When we're pruning smaller branches, um, those will compartmentalize much quicker. Now, there are pruning sealers that are sold it's encouraged to not use those pruning sealers. The intent of the pruning sealer is to cover that wound, right? Cover the wound so that pests can't get into that tree. The intent is good, but the reaction or the result isn't necessarily very good for the plant. All this does is puts a foreign material to protect the wound or seal the wound, that this callus roll has to try to go over and compartmentalize. It's an added layer that's unnecessary and um, creates a condition that um, ends up compartmentalizing a foreign material within the plant. So nothing about that is beneficial to that plant. Best move is make those cuts young, make those cuts proper, and make them into the proper location without crushing plant material.
Now, I talked about collars, branch collars. You can see it here, okay? So here we've got sort of a rogue um, uh, branch that's coming off, and it looks like this one has died out. You can see that the branch collar is much thicker around this small dead branch. It's trying to compartmentalize it, but it's got a lot of branch to get around. So frankly, unless this is cut off, it will never make it to entirely compartmentalize it. Right here, you can see, okay? So a lot of plants, some plants it's difficult to see, some plants it's very easy. Um, uh, some plants it's very easy to see it. In this tree here, you can see a defined line of where that branch collar is. If you were to need to prune this off, then you would want to make the pruning cut as close to the branch collar as possible without injuring the branch collar. So this right here is the collar. You would want to make the cut just outside of that. Okay, as close as you can, just outside of it. Here, you see the result of not making that clean cut. This tree here had a branch that was cut for whatever reason. Maybe it was already dead or it was broken at the tip, but it was cut kind of like this one here. The tree realizes that it has been cut and it essentially ends up allowing that branch to die so that it can compartmentalize its wound. This ends up turning into this, which ends up causing a large cavity within that tree that is amazing opportunity for disease and pests to infest that tree and end up potentially killing that tree. You can see here that this must have happened a really long time ago. And it honestly looks like that tree is trying to spit like a, a, a loose tooth out of its mouth, right? But it can't do it that quick. So proper cuts <clears throat> just beyond the branch collar as, as young as possible is super beneficial to plants, okay? more. Of course, we're always injuring that plant, but early and proper is the best move. So sometimes when we're dealing, if we're in a position where we have to prune a plant um, and remove a larger branch that has some weight to it, then we need to be aware of the fact that we could end up causing a lot more damage to that tree um, by cutting it improperly. So if we're beyond the point where we can cut it with loppers and we need to use some sort of saw, then we need to be aware that when we make that cut, we can end up damaging the tree even more. Here, what you see is somebody made a cut, but as they were cutting it, they started on this side, they were cutting through and the weight of that branch once it was released from the rest of the tree, ended up tipping down and tearing down, okay? So this tree is gonna have a really tough time compartmentalizing this wound. So if you have to prune these trees, make sure that, or a branch that's heavy, do a three saw cut, okay? The first cut is, so you see here, Branch collar, okay, so that's branch collar. We can't cut in like that, okay? You can't make that cut. You're gonna cause a lot of problems. So we find the area outside of it. And this line is, is a great definition of where the proper cut on this is. This tree sort of has a clean line on it. It's telling you what to do. Again, some plants um, really show you where you should be plant uh, cut pruning it. Other plants are a little bit tougher to read. So the final cut is here, but the first cut is about a third of the way up through that branch, far enough 
to relieve the pressure, but not deep enough that you get the saw stuck. So once you do this cut a quarter to a third of the way through, again, don't get the saw stuck. You can recover from it. You're gonna need a new saw, but um, uh, cut up and in. The next cut is just beyond that where you're gonna cut down through this branch and the result is going to be that as you cut through this, once you get halfway to it, two thirds of the way through this cut, this branch is going to fall down and it is going to tear down. But as it tears, it stops at the first cut. So the tear stops here. At that point, you've relieved the weight off of this branch and you can make your final clean cut, which again is incredibly important because otherwise this is the result and you will forever have that scar on the tree. And frankly, that tree may never recover from that wound. That ends trees. Now we're moving on to caring for woody shrubs. So some common shrubs or trees you want to prune regularly, okay? Crepe myrtles, um, generally, you're only pruning them for shape and to encourage flower production, but not top it. Other plants that you probably want to prune regularly are butterfly bushes or budlias, roses, and then some other California native shrubs. Okay, so when you're looking at which plants you should be pruning regularly, essentially the exterior of the plant, but not hedging, these are plants that um, typically will flower the most off of new growth, okay? True with crepe myrtles, true with butterfly bushes, roses, and a lot of California natives. So crepe myrtles, lagerstromias, um, they bloom on new growth. Um, it's really important to know how big your crepe myrtle is meant to be, okay? Um, uh, there are some newer crepe myrtles that are out there that are very small, but generally crepe myrtles grow to be about 20 feet tall or higher. Trying to keep large crepe myrtles small is setting yourself up for extra work and pest frustration. So understanding which type of crepe myrtle you have is really important. Of course, if you're buying that crepe myrtle and installing it, you're going to know what it is. If it's been in your landscape for years and years, you may not know the, the cultivated variety of that plant. So it's important to look at the overall natural form of the plant and the flower color and the leaf shape. Okay, crepe myrtles have, um, between different types of crepe myrtles, they have a little bit different leaf shape, definitely a different colored flower, and certainly very different um, uh, different types of um, uh, size, mature size characteristics. So if you've got a crepe myrtle, try to figure out which type it is and understand that allowing it to grow to its mature size is the most appropriate way to do it and the easiest one from a maintenance time standpoint as well as a reduction in pest pressure. Um, so these crepe myrtles, um, uh, the, um, these photos show um, plants that have been pruned incorrectly. Okay? These right here, this one on the left has had heading cuts, you can see it. This one has had heading cuts as well. So this has been pruned down to a point where it's pushing up its new growth off of that, but it's not the natural spot that those um, these trees want to be pruned or 
Um, it's controlling their growth in such a way that's detrimental to their health. Crepe myrtles prefer to be pruned in late February or early March. What you wanna do is selectively thin out branches to allow better circulation. It's okay to head smaller branches, okay? Branches that are thinner than a pinky, okay? So um, uh, that's, that's okay, but larger than a pinky, you really don't want to. So you wanna selectively thin out branches to allow that better circulation. Do it as early as possible. You can see this is, these are beautiful multi-trunks, but the way that they're being treated up top significantly increases the opportunity for pest pressure. Um, and so making sure that they're pruned properly is um, really important. When you prune them in this fashion, again, you're encouraging heavy vegetative growth, which encourages aphids, and you're getting much denser um, uh, vegetative growth with less air circulation that significantly encourages all sorts of other diseases. Butterfly bushes or budlias <coughs> really need pruning for best bloom and structure. So what you wanna do with budlias is in the summer, as blooms fade, cut those branches back to a set of leaves. So here, right, you see this, we've got some blooms fading. If you have plenty of time to repeat prune this plant, the best move would be to prune this plant right here. So going back to the next node, to the next leaves and the next buds coming out, prune back to this. If you don't want to continuously do this throughout the summer, then prune a little further back. Maybe go back to the next set of leaves that doesn't have in bloom buds. Okay, so follow the branch back from the, um, uh, the spent blooms. Go back to the next node that hasn't produced these blooms yet. There's going to be some buds there. Prune it back to that. And within about three to four weeks, you're going to have another flush of growth. Okay, so the further you cut it back, the um, uh, the less uh, maintenance you will have to do throughout that season. If you've got the time and you want the heavy blooms constantly, then don't go as deep into the plant. Now, it's important to address butterfly bushes in this way and finding the correct spot to cut these or prune them back or traditional deadheading them back um, uh, because the alternative is hedging them back. When you do that, you're indiscriminately cutting the entire plant and you're causing, again, excessive vegetative growth and very dense growth that reduces air circulation that encourages pest problems, which encourages the use of pesticides, which we wanna to try to avoid. So that's during the summer for butterfly bushes. In the winter, cut the whole butterfly bush back to about 18 inches, okay? Take the old thick branches down to the ground and you can also thin it out. So here you see the before in winter. And then after the pruning, this is what you should see. And really the reason for that is that you end up with the really good blooms. You're not leaving it in the summertime. You're not leaving a bunch of plant material within that that's gonna reduce air circulation. Um, and you're allowing those that rejuvenation of plant material for those really heavy blooms. Carpet roses. So carpet roses do best with selective pruning and very occasional fertilization. Again, we strongly encourage the use of compost and mulch. <clears throat> 
Um, sometimes roses are very heavy feeders, no matter which rose, for the most part. There's a couple of roses that aren't, but carpet roses, floribundas, um, grandifloras, hybrid teas, they all prefer a little bit higher nutrient levels. So really um, dealing with these, um, keeping them tidy can be sort of the bigger challenge. Um, now in the, um, uh, in the summertime, you, if these, this is when these are blooming and heavy bloom springing into summer. If you, um, if you have the time and you don't like some unsightly portions of the plant, then you can prune back outward facing buds to shape um, and refresh blooms and keep it tidy. You'll get more blooms and you'll have less dead um, old blooms if you go in and do some selective pruning during the summertime, okay? That's okay to do. During the winter, um, carpet roses may get too dense over time. So you will find this, right? They get dense and dense and dense. This in the winter, when they're deciduous and they've lost their leaves, this gives you a really good opportunity to really look at the interior structure of that plant and make some pruning cuts. So over time, they do get dense, generally in the winter, every two to three years. Take a look at it, remove some of the largest or oldest branches from the base to increase that airflow which will again, decrease the likelihood of fungal diseases and a lot of other diseases, okay? So summertime, selectively prune, deadhead, prune back to some sort of outward facing bud and you'll see them, you'll see those buds on it, make sure they're outward facing going away from the, the interior of that plant. We wanna encourage that outward budding instead of heavy interior crossing budding. Okay, so summertime, prune selectively, deadhead, find those outward facing buds when you're deadheading. And then every couple seasons, go in and do a really solid um, pruning on that, um, on that plant when you can see its interior structure and you can prune out the oldest or largest canes to the base. Um, and you can go in after that and lower all the newer growth, okay? So cut them back, um, shorten those remaining branches um, and cutting again to an outward facing bud. So this is a good indication that there's a bud. Here, tough to see in this picture, but um, there's some other spots that um, uh, the buds are, um, uh, pushing here, you can see an outward facing bud here. It's coming out towards us. You can see one here. So you're really cutting these down to about six to 12 inches and finding some outward facing buds, clearing out the interior so that we're encouraging the outward growth and not interior crossing, okay? So that takes us through carpet roses. The next one, next woody shrub we're gonna look at are some California natives. Now, a lot of California native shrubs that are used, especially in our region, typically come from the um, uh, chaparral ecosystem, okay? Now, in California, before it was settled, um, summer fires were really normal. So there's a lot of California native woody shrubs that can survive fire and are adapted to fire every many years and can essentially be rejuvenated by fire, essentially everything getting burned off, but its root structure is strong and it can grow back in a much more healthy way. Now, in our landscapes, we don't necessarily or shouldn't be pruning using fire. So we want to mimic that fire. 
um, and that is called Kopisi. Um, and really it is cutting older plants up to a half of the way back to lengthen their life, okay? Alternatively, you can replace them when they're really old, but there are a lot of shrubs, uh, California native shrubs that benefit from this. Um, ultimately, uh, plants like some Ceanothus, Baccharis, Coyote brush, um, Garia, um, silk tassel plant um, or silk tassel tree and some other chaparral natives will become, after they become overly woody, um, if that ends up happening, then they can die prematurely. So it's good to cut them back significantly um, once they're mature and once they start getting a little bit leggy. And here's a really good example. This right here is a mature coyote brush. Um, and this is, um, uh, it's Baccharis. Um, uh, it's actually an amazing plant, amazing green to it. Um, there are uh, low growing ones, there's larger shrubs, um, but over time they get woody and leggy. So mimicking fire, essentially this gets cut entirely back and you get brand new fresh growth out of it for a large shrub. Um, uh, not all plants react perfectly to this. Um, know the plant that you're addressing like this and whether it can take it. Um, and uh, But it is a really good way to deal with uh, several uh, California native plants where you're pruning for full rejuvenation. Um, a lot of times, uh, if you don't, then that plant will end up just sort of petering out and dying. So um, this severe pruning um, uh, went down to six to 12 inches, and you can see that it quickly encourages really lush new growth, okay? So that's one other technique that you can use with woody shrubs, especially California natives. So looking at perennials next, okay? We've gotten through all of our trees and woody shrubs. Looking at perennials, really, what is a perennial? Well, a lot of times these are the softer green plants with floppier stems, and generally we're using them for a lot of flowers. And the majority of them die back in the winter or go into a dormant period in the winter. Um, <clears throat> examples of this are California fuchsia, catmint or nepeta, coreopsis, the asters, um, uh, Echinacea, Lantana, uh, Achillea, Gara, Santa Barbara Daisy, Euphorbias, Ornamental Oreganos, um, uh, and, um, and this is really just a short list of all the perennials that grow really well in our Sacramento region. Okay, now by dieback in the winter, the plant does not die. The majority of the above ground portion of the plant goes into dormancy and leaves, stems, etc. end up dying back. The root and the base of that plant are in perfectly good condition. So addressing that in the winter time um, and clearing that dead material off to make way for the new material and really great flushes of foliage and, and, and flowers is the best move with the majority of the perennials. Really perennials add color to gardens, life to gardens, flowers to gardens, and we generally really can appreciate them in the spring and summer months, some in fall. There's even some perennials that are um, more active in the um, winter time, but uh, most of them spring, summer, and into fall is when they're really active. Um, colorful blooms and 
the critters that they attract, they attract butterflies, hummingbirds, pollinators, beneficial insects. Um, they, they're all great for the garden. Um, they do require a little bit more work when trimming and upkeeping on those things. Um, some only bloom for a couple weeks. Some look ratty or die back to the ground in the winter. Um, above, we see um, some, uh, um, uh, some penstemon. Uh, we see some Texas sun drops. We see some yarrow with some echinacea in the front of it. We've got some California fuchsia here. We've got some erigeron glauca here, and then some cor coreopsis here. Okay, so these are plants that we see um, really fill in the gardens in uh, spring and into summer. And because they have blooms, they're gonna need, end up needing a little bit more deadheading, a little bit more care. It adds to some of the care in the garden, but um, the care for those landscapes is, um, for those plants in the landscape is relatively easy, okay? So caring for these, occasionally trim them in the summer, deadheading of any spent flowers, um, uh, in the winter, removal of the dead stems. Um, early spring, you can pinch back some of the tips um, or the, the potentially flowering shoot, shoots in, in order to encourage more blooming, okay? So summertime, deadheading, any flowers that are spent, cut those back to an appropriate node or leaf set on that plant. And then in the winter, remove all the dead stems, okay? And so for some plants, that's removing almost the entire plant down to the base. Some plants, you're coming back to some more, a little bit woodier growth, but the majority on the of the growth on perennials is very herbaceous. It's not a woody twig-like growth. Um, it's very herbaceous and um, limber. Um, the next thing you wanna do once you've pruned it is clean out the crowns and clear it of any mulch or leaf buildup. Um, this is really important because if you allow dead leaves and mulch to build up within that, you're gonna encourage some diseases. So trim them back, deadhead them in the summertime, um, uh, and then winter do a really significant removal and then clear out the interior of that thing. Um, the next thing that you're gonna do um, uh, is, especially in the winter time, these guys can really benefit from the addition of some compost and if you need to add some organic fertilizer. Generally, if you do your pruning back, you're clear out of the interior, add a little bit of compost around it, that's all you need to do. Yes, it's more work. There's typically a lot of these planted in the landscape, but the care for them is less technical than caring for a tree or a woody shrub. Um, it's a little bit more heavy handed where you're just doing a heavy clear out, clean it up and allow for that new growth to come out really beautifully. Um, shearing is the same thing as hedging though. So, um, and we've already talked about hedging, which is bad. So really kind of what's the difference? Um, uh, you can care for these perennials by shearing and using pro, um, tools like this, you're actually really kind of, if you have to deadhead, this is, this is a catmint or a nepeta. If you have to deadhead this, Getting to every single one can be a challenge, but going through with um, uh, um, a, some hedging shears and clipping all of the spent buds off, getting back to just green material in the summertime is gonna encourage multiple blooms. Um, and really you're just doing it to as quickly as possible, remove the spent flowers without cutting the entire thing back. Now, Hedging on woody shrubs is really bad because the large, the larger, harder branches don't heal as quickly and um, or as easily as the soft herbaceous um, branches and stems of the perennials. So doing this with perennials is actually 100% appropriate as opposed to hedging or shearing woody shrubs. Okay.
um, uh, a really rough analogy is um, uh, if you're hedging back trunk or branch or stems, those are equal to hedging back bones, muscles, and hairs and fingernails. Okay, so if you are doing that with a woody shrub, you're really pulling off the parts of that body that that plant needs <clears throat> in order to survive because it's a woody material. With Again, with perennials, they're much more herbaceous, much less woody. And so shearing them, they can respond to it incredibly well, and it really doesn't bother them. Make sure that when you're shearing, though, that you're clearing out as much of that material as possible. You don't want to shear this and leave a bunch of the cut material inside the plant. Um, uh, so sometimes, quote unquote, mowing can be done. Um, this can be done with hedging shears or hand pruners, a string line trimmer or a mower. And depending on the size of the plant you're dealing with, you may or may not take this approach. This plant right here is a juga. It's, a, it's called carpet bugle. It's a very popular um, ground cover for shadier areas. Now, this plant spreads by rhizomes and stolons. So this plant will spread out. If you plant one four inch pot or a one gallon pot, if there's moisture in the ground, that, one, that plant will spread out to fill that space. And in the springtime and in summer, it will push up these really cool blue flowers. Well, as these flowers get spent, it can be incredibly time consuming to go through and deadhead each one. In the winter, it's a good idea to just go through when, again, it's not going to be dormant, it's not going to be dead, but it will be respiring slowly. Go through and really knock those down and clear them out. And this is likened to mowing because you're essentially taking off all the material. Now, with perennials, the trade-off to having beautiful spring and fall, summer and fall flowering is the reality of the fact that in the winter time, it's probably not gonna look so amazing. Um, and you're also gonna have a bit of an empty spot in that area in the winter. Um, so if you have a 100% perennial garden, then in the winter time, the majority of that area is going to look bare, empty, and frankly, dead. Um, if that bothers you, um, then incorporating some more evergreen plant material into that um, that may not have as showy of flowers um, uh, is a really good thing. It's in, a good thing to incorporate into these gardens so that you still have something attractive when everything else is essentially in dormancy during the winter. Um, so that's sort of the trade-off, right? Ultimately, in the wintertime, you're going to take down all of that plant material down to close to the ground or down to the woody portion, more woody portions of that perennial plant. Good rule of thumb on it, and this doesn't follow the normal horticultural rule of thumb where you're only removing a third of the plant material. You're removing essentially all of it because it's all dormant. It's all dead at that time. So in terms of timing, we've said winter time to address this, but in terms of timing for when to address these plants, the goal is after... Um, uh, either um, pruning them back before, um, uh, sorry, pruning them back after the last frost, but before the spring growth happens, okay? So this dead portion of the plant, as it goes into dormancy, this dead portion of the plant does a pretty good job of insulating 
and protecting the root portion and the more woody portion of the plant. Of course, if it's super unsightly and you don't want to see it, doing some cleanup before that is appropriate. But if you can clean it out after the first frost, sorry, um, after the last frost, but before spring growth, that's the goal. A lot of times that's sometime in February. Um, generally, you don't want to wait too far into March to address these. Um, but goal is after last frost, before spring growth, to do the heavy cutback, clean out, and compost application. Example here, Achillea or Yara, okay? Um, so this is that plant in summer and it looks amazing. Um, it's going great. Uh, then we, and we get beautiful flowers, huge beneficial insect attractor, um, lots of different colors available. Now, as it goes into dormancy and we get into the cooler months, we end up with a lot of that material dying out, okay? We've deadheaded the flowers off, we're down to foliage, we start hitting colder and colder temperatures. Some of this plant is just trying to hang on, but the majority of it, the plant is getting rid of to allow for new vegetative growth and future flowers. So, you can leave it like this. If this is too unsightly for you, do a little cleanup around it. And then in some time after last frost, before spring growth, do a heavy clean out. And you can see here that we have all young leaves popping up and we're gonna end up with this exact same thing the next season. If you don't do this clean out, then all of the new growth needs to get up and through all of this dead material. And season after season, if that continues, you're gonna end up with a lot of dead growth buildup and that plant getting larger and larger and larger being supported through that dead material, which encourages pest problems, encourages unsightly growth and non-uniform growth. So. Heavy clean out. And again, if this is too unsightly for you, do some nipping and clipping and clearing. Um, and then in February, after last frost, before um, spring growth, do a heavy cutback. Catmint or Nepeta. We've already talked about this one a little bit. Um, here you see this in summer, beautiful blooms. This is when you would allow it to bloom, wait for them to die back a little bit for those blooms to be spent. Give it a shearing to encourage another couple flushes of great blooms. Um, then it's going to end up going in through fall, start to slowly go into dormancy. At that point, you're probably gonna wanna do its very last deadheading and shear it back to green growth. Through the winter time, it's gonna do this. It's gonna look completely dead. It's not dead. The base of that plant, the roots are still in great shape. You want to clear that entire thing off, cut that completely back. And when spring growth happens, you're gonna start to see all of this fresh growth coming back and it will repeat itself every single year. Again, if you don't clear this off, then that nepeta or that catmint is gonna grow up and through it and it's gonna repeat it year after year after year and it's gonna get really, really ugly and challenging to deal with. So heavy cutback, very important. One more example. Now, lantana is a really common um, perennial that's used in our region. In some other uh, regions, it's it's not a perennial. It's It stays year round, but we get some really cold temperatures in the winter here. So it's really treated more like a perennial. The best way to treat um, uh, um, uh, lantana in our region is to address it as a perennial. So um, lantana blooms heavy all summer long. 
The nice thing about it is it comes in all sorts of colors. It attracts butterflies. It's a wonderful plant, very bulletproof, really easy on the water demand, um, and really reliable plant. Well, when we hit our really cool temperatures in the summertime, these things die back and end up looking really, really ugly in the winter. Um, so same thing. You're going to want to go through and clear out all of the desiccated or dead leaves that have built up below it. Now, this one's a little bit different because a little bit different than the yarrow or the catmint because it's not quite as herbaceous. It's still a perennial, but these are more woody like stems. So the best move here would be to essentially cut this back entirely to about six inches off of the ground so that you get some really good rejuvenation off of it. After you do that, do a heavy clear out at the base so that you get really good, healthy, brand new growth that has really amazing blooms every summer and all summer long. Last category we're gonna talk about are sub shrubs. Okay, so trees, shrubs, trees and woody shrubs, perennials, and now sub shrubs. So what are sub shrubs? Sub shrubs are halfway between perennials and woody shrubs. They're typically more woody at the base with more herbaceous, softer outer branches. Examples of this include lavender, sages, some of the sages, um, coleonema or breath of heaven, um, artemisia or worm wormwood, um, bluebeard, germander or eucarium. Um, and these may require some sort of combination of sh shearing and pruning, okay? So subshrubs or semi-subshrubs, generally these guys are three, four feet tall and wide or a little bit smaller. Um, and the way that you can recognize them as opposed to a sh woody shrub or a perennial, woody shrubs, all woody growth, perennials, almost entirely more herbaceous or softer branches, and then sub shrubs have a woody base with very herbaceous or softer outer branches. Now, how do we deal with these? Caring for sub shrubs is sometimes a little bit trickier to prune them correctly and well. Um, a lot of times it's okay to leave them entirely alone, but without trimming them, they eventually get proportionately more woody, okay? So they end up developing more and more woody growth. They won't bloom quite as well. And they may end up being kind of cracky, like floppy, and they may, may end up so floppy that they end up cracking apart. There's a lot of lavenders that will do that, although there's some lavenders that are very easy to care for um, and won't do that. Um, then there are some different species within the same genus that may respond differently. So there's no hard and fast guidelines to this. Back to the lavender example. Um, lavender grossos or Provence um, or the, um, uh, the English lavenders, um, those generally um, are cut back in the summertime after blooming. Okay, those ones you would cut back entirely once they're mature to about two to three inches into the foliage, and that's all you have to do. You can do it one or two times a year, but that's with, with the lavendins, the lavandula grosser, grosso, or the Provence lavender, or the phenomenal lavender. There's a lot of those. Um, or the la lavandula angustifolias, which are the English lavenders. Now, all of those, the way that they grow, they lend themselves very well to that type of care. Whereas there's some other lavenders like the lavandula stoiches. Um, uh, those lavenders have a much more woody growth habit and they need to be pruned back at a different time of year and they're a lot harder to deadhead um, 
And if you don't do it, they end up getting super woody and then growing apart, having dead spots and end up kind of cracking apart. And then you need to replace them. So the sub shrubs are a little bit trickier, important to understand which one you've got so that you can understand what to do with it. So here we have an example of Coleonema or Breath of Heaven. Um, and you can see that it's a lot more leggy growth to it. And that leggy growth is really indicative of it being aged, not being pruned back, and developing a much more woody growth habit to it. And Breath of Heavens, yes, they get really cool flowers on them. They kind of coated with the flowers. But the other really nice thing is about these plants is the very fine windblown foliage to them. Um, uh, we've got um, some Santa Lina in here, same kind of thing. Um, if you don't prune these back, you end up with very much more woody growth. And the nice thing about these Santa Linas or lavender cottons is that they get these really cool little pom-pom blooms on them. Um, little, little yellow pom-pom blooms. They're awesome looking. Um, and then they have this really nice gray, very fine looking foliage. Um, if you don't prune them back after flowering um, and prune some into the foliage, then the, the woody portion of the plant ends up pushing further and further out and you get far less blooming out of them and you end up getting woody um, dead sections and them cracking apart essentially. Um, some lavender in the foreground here and it looks like we've got some salvia um, uh, Gregii in here that, um, again, same thing. If you don't cut them back um, and, and do kind of a heavy shearing on them, and remember, shearing woody shrubs is very problematic. Shearing perennials, far less problematic. Um, uh, and in fact, quite appropriate. Shearing sub shrubs, you don't want to shear back down into the woody material, but the more herbaceous material on the outside, you do want to shear that back and head that back. So general guidelines for caring for subshrubs. Um, you can shear it lightly in early spring before bud development to encourage multiple stems. You can deadhead them after the first bloom by shearing. And you can prune them back a little harder after the first frost, but never cut into the wood below the green sprouts. So this right here is a picture of, close up picture of a lavender in winter time or um, uh, kind of uh, late in the winter. You can see here, that there's some herbaceous material coming off of this. This is a woody stem, and then we've got some herbaceous um, material coming off of it. Now, coming in at this point and cutting heavily into the woody um, material can be really pop problematic. Um, uh, cutting instead, cutting back the herbaceous material regularly is a much better move. So here um, you can see this is a Levandula stoiches. This is raspberry ruffles. You can't see the raspberry ruffles right now, but this is a before and after picture of a pruning in February. Ideally, this plant would have been cut back more in the past years to avoid having the heavy outer growth that pulled down the branches. So you can see here, there's woody branches that got really heavy. It became woodier and woodier, and that woody growth pushed further out into the canopy. And the what to do here in February is, well, if you let this go another season, chances are you're going to end up with a really terrible looking sub shrub or a lavender here. And so doing this as heavy as you can pruning without cutting into the woody portions of the branches is the best move. Um, you don't really want to expose that woody center. A lot of times it can be really challenging for the plant to actually recover from it. Um, uh, but sometimes you have to figure out how to correct this. 
Okay, so um, again, subshrubs are the tricky one. Um, really, you know, it's hard to put them into uh, a general category, understanding what plants you have, and even down to what type of lavender you have is really going to help dictate um, the proper pruning at the proper time of year. Okay, so I wish I had an easy answer for you, but with subshrubs, again, subshrubs being partially woody, partially herbaceous, usually having amazing flowers or some sort of kind of amazing foliage to them. Best move is cutting them back after blooming. Okay, so not just deadheading, but cutting back and some into the herbaceous growth after its spent blooms have occurred. So lavenders, most of them are blooming spring and throughout the summer. So if a lot of those um, flowers have um, uh, been spent, cut the flowers, but then cut three, four inches down into the um, herbaceous material, that'll usually encourage another really good flush of flowering um, material. You can repeat that a couple times during the flowering season. And then ideally, after the last time, give it a nice tidy cleanup, cut down into the herbaceous material relatively significantly without hitting the woody material. Leave all of the woody material that you can, but relieve that plant of the older growth so that the woody material doesn't end up cracking under the weight of heavily built up herbaceous material. So that is it for um, pest prevention through proper pruning and maintenance for trees, woody shrubs, perennials, and subshrubs. Thank you all very much.